On behalf of Beaker Street, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, members of the oldest continual, continuous culture in the world, who have passed along an unbroken chain of ancient knowledge of the animals, plants, waterways and skies of Lutruwita. We honour this wisdom and we are grateful to be able to come together on this land to discover and share knowledge. Well, hello Hobart. Thanks very much for coming out this afternoon. You're in for a wild ride and a rare treat. Uh, we're about to blast off uh, for a journey into deep time. But before we go, a bit of housekeeping. If you're wondering where the toilets are, there's, uh, there's all kinds of toilets, accessible toilets included, just outside right, the right. cedar doors. Now back to our journey into deep time. My name is Mark Horseman. I'll be your genial host for this evening. Um, Let's start with uh, how good is Beaker Street Festival? Let's have a round of applause for Beaker Street. <laughs> I've been proud to be have been part of Beaker Street helping out like this for the last seven years, and that's how long Beaker Street's been running for uh, all of a sudden. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, be helping out again this year. So this afternoon, time travel in space. Right now. In the wilds of space, there's a spacecraft with a golden mirror about the size of half of this stage, with a sun shield about the size of a tennis court, uh, and it's orbiting the sun one and a half million kilometres away. So just try to get your head around that. That's happening right now. Dr. Mar Dr. Martin George is going to take us there and beyond to the oldest stars and galaxies when our universe was young and even the very first sources of light were forming. It's called NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. It's the most powerful telescope ever. But how does it work and how is it able to show us beautifully sharp images from an unimaginably distant past? Martin's going to tell us all about that. And even better, we're going to see the pictures. And even better, Following the talk, we'll take in a presentation of some of the web's most stunning and impressive images set to live music by violinist Charlie McCarthy. And then there'll be time for questions at the end of the, of the slideshow. So let me introduce both of, you, both of them quickly. Dr. Martin George is the principal astronomer of the Ulverstone Planetarium. He's uh, many duties at the planetarium. Uh, include running shows with live night sky presentations. So I'm guessing that he's, he's no stranger to uh, sharing his love of the universe uh, in this way. Martin was educated at the University of Tasmania. He got an honours degree in physics and subsequently completed a PhD on the history of low frequency radio astronomy in Tasmania. He's passionate about public communication of astronomy and as you probably know, amongst his many activities, he publishes uh, every week in Saturday's Mercury. And I was very interested to read his story today about the possible discovery of the first Trojan object in another planetary system. Well, if you want to know more about that, maybe Martin will tell you, or you can look it up yourself and read it. Martin's a fellow and former president of the International Planetarium Society, which is the world body of planetarium professionals. And he's also a member of several other astronomy-related professional organisations, such as the International Astronomical Union. On top of that, he's also a key photographer. Though I'm not sure he gets to take photos with the James Webb Space Telescope. And also a passionate bridge player, being an Australian Grand Master. I'm going to do Charlie now as well, and hold your applause for a sec. Originally from Ireland, Charlie McCarthy is a violinist who's performed with symphony orchestras. Celtic dance bands, chamber ensembles, jazz combos, bluegrass and Irish bands, and tonight with a space telescope. After Martin's talk, Charlie uh, will be accompanying uh, these images from the web telescope on his five-string electric violin, and he uses live looping. Now, live looping enables Charlie to build a, a rich musical tapestry right before our eyes. He's playing live, his every performance is different, and basically, during his performances, he records snippets of what he's playing and then loops them to make rich layers of sound. Can't wait. Let's welcome them both.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to bring to the stage Dr. Martin George. Thank you so much, Mark, and, uh, and thank you for having me here at Beaker Street. What a wonderful event this is. And this is the first time I've been into this part of the Theatre Royal. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. I'm going to speak to you today about what's been happening with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I must say right at the outset, I'm not a research astronomer on the telescope, so if you've got questions like what the voltages are on different parts of the equipment on the telescope, I'm afraid I'm going to have to phone a friend. Um, however, let's start off by having a look at the universe in general, so to give you a picture of what we know about the universe, so we can put the James Webb observations really more into context. So I'm going to summarise the universe, hopefully in about five or six minutes. Sounds a bit like something from Monty Python, doesn't it? Uh, but anyway, here we go. Uh, so, right, the first thing that's happened is I'm not working this properly. There we go. Okay. Uh, for a very long time, people thought that the stars, everything they could see in the sky, apart from the planets, were stuck to a great big sphere around them. Well, they are indeed in the planetarium industry, uh, but not like that in the real universe. But that's reflected in some of these wonderful uh, constellation diagrams that, that people have drawn uh, over the very, very many centuries. A big breakthrough came in understanding some of the things in the sky in the 19th century. Astronomers already knew that the stars were actually at different distances from us. Uh, but in the mid-19th century, the third Earl of Ross built what was the world's biggest telescope, really big telescope, at Burr Castle in Ireland, right in the middle of Ireland. And I was speaking to Charlie about this uh, a little while ago, and he's actually been there and performed at that very place, so that was an amazing coincidence. And what he did with this telescope was really quite remarkable. He looked at a fuzzy patch of light up there in the sky and noticed that it had a spiral pattern. These are the times when we didn't know that there were other galaxies other than our own Milky Way galaxy. And this seemed to be like a, a simply a spiral piece of, of or a spiral cloud of gas out there. He even planted trees in a spiral pattern at Burr Castle to, to represent what he had actually seen. The, another one of the fuzzy patches of light up there in the sky was what was called the Andromeda Nebula. Some of you might have heard of Andromeda. And in those early days, it was thought of perhaps as a, as a gassy object, it was a fuzzy object, it couldn't be resolved properly into stars, which in fact, it turned out, it was indeed made of. And uh, moving forward to Edwin Hubble's day, and I'm sure that most of you have heard of Edwin Hubble through the name Hubble Space Telescope. He observed the Andromeda Nebula, as it was called then, with what had become, in the early 20th century, the largest telescope in the world, the 100-inch diameter telescope called the Hooker Reflector, just outside Los Angeles. And he observed this object, the Andromeda Nebula, not only could he see stars in it, he could also measure its distance because of a particular kind of star called a Cepheid variable. And Cepheid variable stars pulsate, they change in brightness, and a decade or so earlier, a lady astronomer named Henrietta Leavitt had discovered that those stars could be used to determine their distance. The, the periods of pulsation could be used. So Hubble had discovered that he was looking at an external star system we now know that it's a galaxy, one out of many billions of galaxies in the universe, and we've come a very, very long way. But we've only known about other galaxies for about the last hundred years, even though the telescope has been around for four centuries or so. When we look up to the sky, uh, as long as you don't have too much light pollution, of course, you can see that we live in a galaxy. And if you get way out away from Hobart into the country skies, on a moonless night, especially at this time of the year. We're so lucky here in the Southern Hemisphere to have the brightest part of the Milky Way passing high in our sky. People in the Northern Hemisphere, they, they envy us a great deal. So this is the kind of view you can get. Well, at least a time exposure photograph has shown more than the eye sees. But get out into the country one night and have a look at the plane of light in our galaxy. I mentioned Edwin Hubble a few moments ago. And this, of course, is one of the most famous telescopes of all. 
It's the Hubble Space Telescope that was launched just over 30 years ago. And it's been providing us with some absolutely wonderful information about the universe and sending back some amazing pictures. This is one of the galaxies that it especially uh, was used to study. To learn more about the distance to this galaxy, known as M101 or Messier 101, and work out the rate of expansion of the universe. The universe is getting bigger and bigger. Anybody heard the galaxy song from Monty Python? Yeah, those figures and about the, the fact that the universe is expanding, they're all correct. It's an absolutely wonderful piece of music. Uh, but anyway, one of the big mysteries, though, that we have about the, this universe full of billions of galaxies is that we don't know what most of it's made of. No. Only a small proportion of the universe is ordinary matter, like you, me, this room, this microphone, and so on. Most of it is not like that. And we really don't understand all that much about the universe when it comes to the proportions. Back in the 1930s, astronomer Fritz Zwicky, that's pretty hard to say after a couple of glasses of wine too, by the way, um, astron this astronomer discovered in the coma cluster of galaxies that there was more material more material than could be actually seen. He discovered what we call dark matter. And even though he discovered this something like 90 years ago, we still don't know what it is. Isn't that amazing? So that was an, ama an important discovery. Much more recently, the uh, Hubble, pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and also some of our best telescopes on Earth have shown us something quite remarkable about the expansion of the universe it's actually getting faster. Something's pushing the universe apart. What's doing it? We're not too sure, but we call it dark energy, and it comprises of nearly 70% of the total energy content of the universe. It's in this room all the time. It's trying to push you apart, by the way. But you can't feel it because it's a very, very weak force, but it is causing the universe to get bigger and bigger, faster and faster. What an amazing discovery. And Australian astronomer Dr. Brian Schmidt was one of the was in one of the two teams that made that discovery in the 1990s. So here we have a bit of a rundown of our universe. Uh, dark matter we think is about 27%. Oh, Add all the normal matter that we're made of, and we only get up to about 32. Uh, and the remainder is this mysterious dark energy. I'm mentioning this because hopefully what the Webb Telescope does is going to help us understand a lot more about that. But let's take a look at what we mean by infrared light. And I'm going to start off by talking about light itself. And I'm sure you've all heard of electromagnetic radiation. It sounds incredibly dangerous, doesn't it? But it's not. Light is electromagnetic radiation. Infrared light is as well. And electromagnetic radiation, is made up of waves of electricity and magnetism travelling together at an enormous speed, 300,000 kilometres every second in a vacuum. But our eyes are sensitive only to a particular range of peak-to-peak -peak wavelengths. And I'm sorry about this diagram being a little bit complicated. Whoops, I'll just go back a bit there. Uh, there we are. Uh, you can see there a diagram of the different wavelengths up there, and I think I can use my... Whoops, oh, that changes the size of my image. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, didn't know that. It's a button I hadn't touched before. Okay, so you can see these different wavelengths just here. And you can see that there are different names for the wavelength ranges. Radio. Yes, radio is electromagnetic radiation. That's around you all the time as well, of course. Uh, we have ultraviolet, X-rays and gamma rays that are shorter in wavelength than visible light. We can't see those either. But here we have what we call infrared light. Light that has wavelengths that's just too long for our eyes to see. You use this all the time. Yes, your TV remote control. It has infrared light that comes out of it. You can't see it, but the sensor on your TV can. I'll put this away because I must return it to my hotel room later. Um, okay, but another way in which infrared light is used is in uh, dangerous situations where there's a fire and a lot of smoke because uh, fire department professionals can actually search for people in smoke-filled rooms by looking for the infrared radiation that comes from their bodies. Did you all know that you are all glowing right now with infrared radiation 
with a wavelength, a peak to peak wavelength of about 12 microns, which is about a hundredth of a millimeter. So if my eyes were sensitive to infrared and we turned all the lights off, I'd see all of your bodies glowing all over the room. But I can't. And that's where the James Webb telescope comes in because it's been constructed so that it can show us those wavelengths from space. So here we have a, a general picture of the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll move straight on to the next slide because we have a bit of a description of the various parts of the telescope. Has anybody here used a, a reflector telescope before with a big mirror at the end? Four and a half people. Okay, right. Um, for those of you who haven't, the idea of this mirror is to gather light. In the case of the James Webb, it's gathering infrared light. And it has a golden mirror because the gold reflects infrared light quite well compared to what are normal mirror coatings that look more whitish and silvery. There's a secondary mirror that bounces the image back through a hole in the primary. There's a sun shield to keep it cool. And this is a very effective one made of five layers of aluminium coated plastic that makes sure that the temperature of the telescope's parts does not exceed 39 kelvins, which translated into Celsius is about minus 234. Very, very cold. And it needs to do that because if the telescope got too warm, it would glow with infrared light, just like our bodies do, and it would ruin all the observations. So if you were up there standing up there in space, well, you wouldn't be able to breathe, but if you were there, your body would wreck all the observations. Your body would be glowing brightly in the infrared. We've also got the, uh, the structure at the back of the, the mirror just there. Uh, we also have the uh, uh, integrated science instrument module. That's where all the science instruments are kept. And there's even a little viewfinder to keep track of where the telescope's actually pointing in space, a bit like a, a finder that you might have on a telescope. Now, what about the location of the web and why it's there? It's actually a long way away from us. I think Mark might have mentioned it's over a, well over a million kilometres away. It's at a very important point in space called L2, as you can see in this slide. There are, in relation to an object orbiting a more massive one, there are five positions in space that are in equilibrium. Positions that an object placed there would just continue to orbit around and it wouldn't wander away from that. So effectively, what that means is that the James Webb is out there, this is not to scale, by the way, is out there about one and a half million kilometres from Earth beyond the orbit of the Moon. And effectively, it's in orbit around the Sun because it's hovering around this L2 equilibrium point. I'm not going to get into any physics here today, but it's a great place to be. And it's out there, compared with the Hubble, which is in orbit around the Earth, for a couple of reasons. First of all, being able to put it there and leave it there, it's, it's actually moving around and around, it can be cooled easily by keeping that sun shield face toward the sun all the time. Also, the Hubble's going around the Earth only 400 or so kilometres up. And that means that sometimes the Earth blocks its view from the things it's trying to see. Whereas with the James Webb, it can look at the same spot of space for a very, very long time without being interrupted by the view of the Earth. OK, let's take a look now at some of the things that it's done. This is one of the very early calibration images from the James Webb. And this, to me, is one of the most exciting that it has ever sent back because of this foreground galaxy that you can see, a couple of them actually, and all the more distant galaxies in the background. And Mark was mentioning we're looking back into time. So how are we doing this? I mentioned to you that light travels at 300,000 kilometres every second. That is very fast. Who's been on a long haul flight around the world or Europe? Yeah, okay. Very good. Maybe not so much over the past few years, but uh, it takes a while, doesn't it? Light would move seven times around the Earth every second if it were travelling in a curve. Now, when we look out to objects like this, we're looking back into time because the light has taken a long time to reach us. 
even from the nearest star system to ours, just over four years. From this particular galaxy in the James Webb image, around about a thousand million years. In other words, a billion years. Can you imagine traveling at that speed in a straight line for a billion years without stopping? That's how far away that galaxy is. And these background galaxies are many times farther away than that. So we are actually looking back into time to periods when the universe was very young. And we don't need Doctor Who's TARDIS to do that. We can look into the night sky every night and look back into time, even to the nearby stars, years, centuries. So our eyes are time machines in a way. But the James Webb, because it can show us the universe at earlier stages than ever, is the most powerful we've ever had. Let's take a look at some of the, uh, the great images that the, uh, the James Webb has come up with. This is one of the very early ones. Uh, this is what we call a planetary nebula. Nothing to do with planets. It's just that through primitive telescopes centuries ago, they just looked like fuzzy round things with the shapes of planets. That's all. That's the only connection. But in this particular picture of this, we're looking at an expanding cloud of material that's been shed by a star in its death throes. This is going to happen to our sun. I'm often asked whether the sun will explode. It won't, so don't panic. But this kind of thing will happen to our sun. Although the James Webb has shown us something very interesting here. Hopefully you can see that there are shells of emissions, different layers. A bit like those tide marks you have in your bath if you don't clean it properly. And what we are looking at there are shells that have been ejected at different times. And we've discovered that deep within the centre there, there are actually three stars, not just one. And one of the three stars in the system is swirling around and around and causing this shell-like structure to, to appear in the emissions from this object. And this particular one is a really, really famous one in astronomy. Once again, it's called a planetary nebula, material ejected by a dying star. And it's called the ring nebula. And through even a quite small telescope, it looks like a, a puff of a ring of smoke from a cigarette. Well, people don't smoke these days, of course, I know. Um, but it, uh, this is what we're seeing now with the James Webb. Why are we getting these colours? This is not what we would see through a telescope. These are artificially coloured images, like the one you've just seen. You see, we can't see infrared light, as I've mentioned. So what happens is that the computers translate the infrared image into a visible image so we can understand it, so we can see it. So I'm often asked about that. Are these colours real? No, they're not. But they look rather nice, don't they? And they help astronomers to analyse what's going on. So there we have the Ring Nebula, and you'll notice the date on this, August 2013. You know, I had a, a slide preparation all ready for today, and then they, they uh, released this image of the Ring Nebula, and I couldn't resist changing it to make sure you could see this, because I'm really excited about that image. Now, I'm sure there's some Star Trek fans amongst us. Yes, from the original series. Oh yes, I could tell. Okay. And this is like one of those blobby things that's approaching the Enterprise and Mr. Spock doesn't quite know what it is, but it's not life as he knows it and all that kind of thing. This is what's called a Herbig Harrow object, named after a pair of astronomers who discovered this kind of thing. What we're looking at is not a gap in the universe. It's actually a cloud of dark material. And inside that cloud, stars are forming. And we can see a jet of material that's being sent out to one side there, giving us a, a hint as to what's in there. But just like the fire, fire brigade can find a person in a smoke-filled room, we can see through this cloud of material with the James Webb telescope, and this is what it actually looks like inside. So infrared light is helping us see things that we couldn't possibly see in any other way. This is a, a part of the sky uh, in the region of the constellation of Scorpius, the Scorpion, which actually does look a bit like a scorpion, but I'm only showing you part of it here. In the spot in space around about the middle of that picture where I have my arrow now, my, my point of light now, we have a, an amazing star-forming region. It's called the Roofyukai Dark Cloud. Stars 
are formed from great big clouds of material that we call giant molecular clouds. They collapse, bits and bits and pieces of the cloud get more and more dense, the cloud collapses under its own gravity, gets very hot, and it forms stars. And this was released only last month, in early July, I think, somewhere around the 9th or the 10th of July. Uh, and here we can see what looks like a ghostly veil surrounding a star right in the middle just there. So we've got a, a veil of hydrocarbons. We have red, which is representing streaks of hydrogen gas. And we've got several star-forming points in this particular image. And it's an absolutely striking image that's helping us understand more about star formation. And isn't this frightening? This one, to me, it's, it's ghostly. But again, this part of the Eagle Nebula would not look like this just to our eyes alone, even if we were right up next to it. These, this image is an infrared image from the James Webb Telescope, and it's showing us a star-forming region in such detail that we can look into the region where individual points of light are starting to shine, stars that are being born in this amazing cloud of material, this giant molecular cloud, effectively. One of the other galaxies that James Webb has studied in detail is, is Messier 74. It's also called the Phantom Galaxy, and that's because the galaxy is facing us almost face on, which means that its light is very spread out and it's really hard to see through the telescope, or through amateur telescopes anyway. We can see on the left there a picture from the Hubble. On the right, a picture from the James Webb, again, artificially coloured. Uh, and it's showing us these star-forming regions very, very clearly. So images like this are showing those places where stars are forming and helping us to understand what's going on in the spiral arms of, our, of galaxies, including our own, as a matter of fact. Isn't this a wonderful image? This is one of the greatest pieces of computer wallpaper that's come out of the James Webb. But it's scientifically very, very significant. Now, a long time ago, the, the Hubble made its first picture called the Ultra Deep Field, looking back in time to when the universe was very, very young. And in this particular picture, it took 11 days for the Hubble to expose for long enough onto its CCDs to build up this picture. But for the James Webb, it's got a bigger mirror. As Mark said, the mirror's about half the size of this stage. Uh, it only took about uh, less than a day, only 0.8 of a day. So we can get these images much more quickly with the James Webb, as well as getting different information. Now, one of the other exciting times in the history of our universe is the era of what we call reionization. Put quite simply, where you have atoms that are being blown apart again by the radiation. The protons and the electrons are being re-separated after settling into neutral atoms of hydrogen. And we know that this all happened when the universe was a few hundred million years old. It was happening fairly gradually. And the big question is, how exactly did it happen? And the James Webb Telescope, sorry, I went for two slides there. The James Webb Telescope is actually showing us how this happened with galaxies forming. The energy from the stars in those galaxies blowing apart the atoms and ionising the universe, making it transparent to light. Because before that, light wasn't getting through it, the dark period of the universe. And here we can see what reminds me of the little bits of red paint that I spilt in kindergarten on the floor. They are little blobs, that's all they are. But these are galaxies that are forming. And they're forming, they were forming when the universe was extremely young. And this particular one, this one that's been given the catalogue name JD1, it was discovered this year, is the most distant we've ever discovered. 300 million years after the Big Bang. And I could spend hours talking about the Big Bang, and I'm about to use up my whole half an hour here, so I won't. Um, but this is a real surprise, actually, for astronomers. Because this galaxy should not have been this well developed only 300 million years after the universe began. What's gone wrong with our ideas? So as so often happens with science, you answer a few questions, you get a few more, sometimes more than you started with. We can even see places where 
galaxy clusters are beginning to form. Not this cluster of galaxies you see here, this bright one, but these tiny little points in the squares have been identified as being about the same distance away, about the same epoch in the very early universe, and they are about to form a galaxy cluster, which they have no doubt done by now. But we're looking back over 13 billion years in time. This is what they look like then. And one of the most exciting ones for me uh, is this particular galaxy called NGC 6822. It's not a very exciting sounding name, I know. Uh, NGC stands for New General Catalogue, which is far from new. It was developed in the 19th century. Uh, but nevertheless, this particular galaxy has a great historical significance because it was in the 1920s that Edwin Hubble was studying this. And this was the very first galaxy that he ever noticed was separate from our own. He noticed this, or published information about this anyway, before he published the information about Andromeda. It's a relatively small galaxy in our local group of a few tens of galaxies. Uh, and we are now studying star formation in this galaxy like never before. Because the James Webb is allowing us, with its infrared eye, to see all of this happening. This is a really interesting galaxy to study because it has a relatively low content of elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium. An interesting relic from the past. Okay, a few more things before we finish. Uh, the James Webb has also been able to tell us about the atmospheric composition of planets moving around other stars. It's told us about water, carbon dioxide. I won't go into too many technical details about this diagram, but it's done by watching when a planet moves in front of its star and seeing how it filters out the light of the star. We've seen this amazing picture of Jupiter in the infrared. What a lot of detail we're seeing here. This, by the way, is the Great Red Spot, which is not red in infrared terms. It's just a bright spot in infrared light. Uh, it's sticking about 25 kilometres above its surroundings. Uh, and th there are high altitude clouds uh, that appear white in the infrared, just like around the equator of Jupiter. Uh, and we can even see places where on Jupiter's moons there are, in the case of the moon Io, the hotspots. You might have heard that Io is a volcanic moon, looks a bit like a pizza. You've seen pictures of that before. Uh, and it's the most volcanic body in the solar system. Now we can clearly see directly with the James Webb the heat there. And on the left, Jupiter's moon Ganymede. These areas here are showing us where there is Wait for this, hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, wow. Um, and it's because uh, charged particles moving around Jupiter are hitting the icy surfaces near the poles and converting the water into H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. So we can study things very indirectly like that. Great view of Neptune's rings. Yes, Neptune has rings as well. So does Uranus. Well, it doesn't matter how you pronounce that, it sounds bad. And also Jupiter and Saturn. And this is a really quite incredible image. Why do the rings show up so well here? Because we can't normally see these with our telescopes from Earth. We're looking at an infrared view where the planet itself is not as bright. So the rings show up much more clearly. So there we are. Many of the things that the web has been doing for us, this is a, a beautiful star-forming region in, in a nearby galaxy called the Small Magellanic Cloud. Um, there's a lot to come. It's been operating for only a year. We hope that it will go for many, many more years. It's the most amazing instrument we've ever had. I'm excited about it. The Hubble's still there. It's still doing some great stuff. And so are the telescopes here on Earth because they're getting more and more advanced. And uh, here in Australia, and I'll finish off with this comment because I, I'm very proud of this, Australian astronomers do more research per head of population than any other country in the world. We are actually number one. And there are a lot of researchers who are working on data from the web. I'll leave that with you, and uh, I'm really now looking forward to hearing Charlie. So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you.